So do you think we should everybody and welcome Rachel. It's so nice to have you present what is going to be our last paper in this seminar series. So um, before I um, introduce you, I wish to acknowledge that we're standing on Indigenous country that has never been ceded and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. I myself am standing on Wurundjeri country in Fitzroy in inner Melbourne and I acknowledge elders past, present and emerging wherever you may be. Um, Rachel Hand is um, our expert on all things at Dublin from WA, really. And uh, I know that she used to work in Dublin and she's now at uh, the Museum of um, Anthropology and Archaeology at Cambridge University. And she's really been part of the extended Collecting the West team for quite a while now. So, Rachel, over to you to speak to us about Irish colonists to geologists reimagining Western Australia. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I'd like to acknowledge first that the Noongar material I'll be discussing today is far from country, which was never ceded. I should also acknowledge that while I'm a museum ethnographer, I'm neither a specialist in Noongar or Irish histories, but that this research has formed part of my wider investigations into the ethnographic collection of the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin for a forthcoming book with the museum. While the Western Australian material held by the museum today offers glimpses into the relationship between the Noongar material, people and the Irish colonists, I've also been fascinated by some of the reimagining of this material in Ireland, both inside and outside of the museum. Collected by a growing professional middle class, by both collectors, uh, but both Protestant and Catholic, they reflect the revaluing of indigenous material by both collectors and museums, its commodification into toys, specimens emblematic of social evolutionary ideas, mathematical victories, and in some cases, a very basic monetarization. Today, there's over 100, 320 um, Indigenous objects from Western Australia um, in the National Museum, encompassing weapons, clothing and ceremonial material. 34 of these, we think, were collected by early Irish colonists and colonial officers in the Swan River colony on Wadjet Noongar country and further south in King George Sound on Menang uh, Noongar country. They were donated to the museums of the Royal Dublin Society and Trinity College during the 1830s and 1840s. Some donors gave material to multiple institutions and uh, may well have in influenced um, each other's sort of um, presentations. Few bear old labels that can be connected them to the original donor and no catalogues exist of the contents of either museum. Um, these both museums uh, were transferred uh, to the Dublin Science and Art Museum established in 1877, which later became the National Museum of Ireland following the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 18, 1921. I'll be looking briefly at these first and then looking at later acquisitions by the Science and Art Museum up to 1914 and that transfer that um, we were talking about. Now, Noongar material circulated in Dublin from at least 1834, the year before the first donation of material to the Irish museums. The newspapers at the time reveal some of the fascinations that the Kylie or the boomerang held for the public as well as academics. Gaisel, Skullthorpe and others in the Collecting the West team have been looking at the collecting practices of George Fletcher Moore, who emigrated from Ireland in 1830 to become Judge Advocate General and later Colonial Secretary. He established a farmstead at Millenden on the Upper Swan River, returning to Ireland briefly in 1840 and finally in 1852, after which he was based in London. George sent his older brother, Sir Sir Joseph Scott Moore, Noongar material, including Kylie and natural history specimens, such as emu feathers for his sisters. There's no details on when George actually sent the Kylie to Ireland, but he did see one for the first time uh, when it was thrown in September 1833 by a Noongar man he called Blackman. He was fascinated with the returning techniques and sketched a small crooked stick in his journal. Now, Joseph, I'm afraid I couldn't find a proper image of Joseph, so you have a rather <clears throat> interesting dummy here. Um, he played a really significant role in circulating and reimagining Noongar material in Ireland. He and fellow members of the Royal Irish Ac Academy hotly debated the weapons histories and aerodynamics. The Academy, founded in 1785, promoted the investigation of the sciences, polite literature um, and antiquities and was a key component in Dublin's developing intellectual scene. 
Irish barrister and antiquarian Samuel Ferguson also compared the Kylie to weapons of antiquity. It's likely it was Ferguson's anonymous contribution to Saunders' newsletter in 1837 that decried them as nothing new and claimed that antecedents were clearly referenced in Ovid's 8th century metamorphoses of Greek mythology. Joseph was unable to make the example his brother sent him actually return, and so he modified the angle of the bend and made a new, new piece. Using this adapted Irish version of the Kali, he was able to reproduce the classic figure of eight revolution. He anonymously published the first accurate description of their flight in the February 1838 magazine uh, edition of the Dublin University magazine titled The Boomerang and Its Vagaries. The magazine was an independent periodical better known for its literally cultural and political essays, and Moore's analysis of the Kylie's flight was deemed frivolous and apparently, quote, decidedly not worth of a place in papers by the university. They were rather sniffy. Moore's article opened to his comment that the Kylie had offered the most universal satisfaction of the advantages we have derived from our Australian settlements. The developing colonies offered many material advantages and George Moore was one of many Irishmen who used the colonial administrative infrastructures to develop his own judicial career and acquire land. There was little understanding of country and indigenous lifeways. Though he questioned the colonizers' right, colonizers right to seize countries already peopled and driving out or massacring innocent and defenseless natives, he also held a typical racist evolutionary view that the condition of the Aborigines may be ameliorated um, and he also hoped that the colonizers new properties would remain secure from hazard. Carpenters were kept busy making copies of Joseph Moore's adapted Kylie, which became sources of public entertainment. These advertisements for toy shops on Dublin's Grafton Street show they became the desirable toy of 1838. The local newspapers described how boomerangs were being flung around the university's cricket ground, but also on the quayside in Cork in the south of the island. These activities were gleefully reported by George Moore back in Australia in the Perth Gazette. For those that haven't visited Dublin in a while, Grafton Street remains the preeminent shopping district on Dublin's south side of the River Liffey. Kylie were not the only indigenous material to be copied and repurposed, as these advertisements also list Woomera or spear throwers, um, usually from the southeast, as well as bows and arrows. George Moore, however, decried the public adoption of the Eastern Australian term boomerang over the Noongar word Kylie, which he and his brother had been assiduous in using. Public recognition and academic brownie points also figured large in Dublin in 1838, as arguments broke out in print on who was the first to describe the flight of this boomerang, or Kylie. Joseph Moore's explanation was contested by a correspondent in Liverpool who claimed a Liverpudlin physician, Dr. Jeffries, has ex had exhibited it in November 1834, to the Liverpool Medical Society with a description of its form, use and mathematical properties and had published it in a local newspaper. It seems as though copies were also being made in Liverpool around the same time. However, here too, George Fletcher Moore remains a key part of the history. The correspondent, possibly Thomas Jeffrey himself, had read a copy of Moore's journal and obtained a so-called real Kyling that Moore had sent to a Liverpool family. As George remained in Australia in 1840, it was Joseph who donated the Noongar material to the museums on his behalf. It's Joseph's Dublin address of Hume Street, which is used in the Royal Dublin Society's register entry on the 2nd of January, 1835. This was the first donation of Noongar material to an Irish museum. Since its foundation in 1731, the Royal Dublin Society aimed to stimulate economic activity and industrial development in Ireland and had professors in botany, chemistry, mineralogy and veterinary science who gave public lectures and demonstrations. The Society's museum was established in 1792 with, with the acquisition of the Leskian cabinet full of mineral and insect collections and from 1800 donations of indigenous material were added to the growing Museum of Natural History. Material was initially displayed as curiosities and later racially classified under the broad umbrella of natural history, which at that point embraced geology, zoology, botany, as well as ethnology. The small but well-documented gift of six items presented by George Moore to the Society in 1835 was noted as a series of weapons from Swan River, most of which, as you can see here, were described by the Noongar names. The register lists the six pieces, um, a boreal or quartz edge spear, a myro or spear thrower, although here Moore has actually used the Eastern term woomera, um, a codger axe, a tarp or quartz edge knife, a kali, 
and some tree bark. It's interesting to note Moore's spelling of the term cadion for codge, which he later spelt in his 1842 vocabulary as K-A-D-J-O, suggesting his ear and transcription of Noongar words changed and improved over time. And usually these six items are actually described in detail and printed in the society's public proceedings, rather than a single line or sometimes word used to describe a whole collection. Is this because it came from one of the newly established colonies? Um, the level of information that George sent um, with the material, or was it an attempted to change to document material much better following the death of the previous curator, Charles Gissica? It's not possible to link the individual items, uh, okay, there we go, to link individual items to specific collection events though. This 1835 donation corresponds very broadly with material that are readily available. Moore described how he traded bread and flour with Udoma and Waitung for two barbed spears, one of which would have lost its quartz egg, edge and a throwing board. Later that day, he also bought two throwing boards and made each Dorbup, Blackman, Weep, Gionup and Weenet a throwing board in return from pieces of sword mahogany. I'd love to know if these uh, sword boards are still around. However, oops, not all his collecting was amicable. In 1832, following an altercation where one man died, weapons as well as bags and cloaks from nearly 60 men, women and children were confiscated and stolen. Moore took home five spears, two knives, a hatchet and two or three bags made of kangaroo and opossum skins. He sketched some of these items, as you can see here, in incredibly tiny detail, including a bag which I'll be coming back to later. There are several items in the uh, Dublin Society collections that could be from Moore such as this, this um, codge here, or a Myro spear thrower. Could this be, codge be the knife made from quartz was given to Moore in May 1833 by Weir, a leader of the Wajat Ninga. The use of the term cutter on the spear thrower, however, which usually refers to a fighting stick from the southeast, suggests it's probably not part of his donation, but the author and donor remain unknown. However, other donors also donated Find the right button. There we go. Other donators, ugh, other donors also gave Noongar material, which complicates all these attributions to specific donors. In 1843, six jars of reptiles and several specimens of arms and other articles collected by George Joseph Webb were given by his mother Jane. This followed earlier gifts from Swan River from, of seeds deposited in 1842 and 1843 by his father William, who was Deputy Commissioner General at the Royal Barracks, now Collins Barracks which is the site of the decorative arts branch of the National Museum of Ireland and where currently the Australian material is stored. George Joseph Webb, usually written in the Dublin Society registers as J.G. Webb as well, and the proceedings, followed in his father's footsteps and was part of the commissary staff in Perth on Wajan Noongar country from 1839 to 48 and later moved further south to King George Sound on Menang Noongar country until 1850. Like Moore, Webb chronicled colonial life and his Our Western Australian Home, being sketches of scenery and society in the colony, appeared in the Swan River News and the Western Australian Chronicle in 1847. Webb was part of a prominent Anglo-Irish family. His mother, Jane Blackburn, grew up in Rathfarnham Castle and granddaughter of George Blackburn, the Attorney General, Lord Chief Justice and High Chancellor of Ireland. Webb's time in the Swan River region overlapped with Moore, and despite his professional role supplying food and uniforms with the colony's military forces, he led a very active social life organising balls and regattas. While George Moore and George Webb may not have known each other in Dublin, colonial society was small, and they attended the same Perth dinners and theatricals, and celebrated the 1840 St Patrick's Day together with Moore's friend from Ireland, Richard Nash. Apparently, the three of them were dubbed the social sons of the Emerald Isle, and added greatly to the festivities with song. Although there's no list of Webb's material, several old handwritten labels remain, which reconnect two tarp quartz inlaid saw knives, an ochre skin bag here, and a small shield to George Webb. These prominent lab labels, which include Mrs. Webb's name and the family address of Lower Mount Street, Dublin, were meant to be seen on display and reinforce the social capital contained within museum donations. Swan River was well known as a new colony and represented a dynamic new world of opportunities, albeit one which of growing racial theories ignored the rights of the of Aboriginal inhabitants. 
the shield here, the wonder, is decorated with deeply fluted vertical lines infilled um, with white. These used to parry shields, uh, so, uh, beg your pardon, used to parry spears and um, were often traded into the, into the region. But the unusually small size of this shield, it's only um, about uh, just over 30 centimetres long, um, suggest it may have belonged to a child or possibly have been made for sale. I don't know. The sinew sewn marsupial skin bag here, heavily embedded with ochre, may have been used to carry ritual objects or post, as one of the, um, as Kimberly has also noted before. Moore's drawings in his diary also depict a shimmer shaped bag with a triangle flap. You can see here this teeny tiny sketch uh, referencing the bag he had taken for the Aboriginal camp in 1832. Given their close acquaintance, it's possible Moore gave Webb one of his bags. Moore and other donors also gave Australian material to Trinity College Dublin. This institution had been established in, the museum had been established in 1777 to house Cook Voyage curiosities collected um, on the second Cook Voyage in the Pacific by Irish surgeon James Patton of HMS uh, Resolution. The long curatorship of natural historian Wickley Stokes from 1791 to 1844 ensured the museum's emphasis on natural history with growing type collections of geological and zoological material. The arrival of director Robert Ball in 1844 reinvigorated the scientific nature of the museum and he attempted to make it a ca cabinet of instruction rather than a mere museum of rarities. This picture of the museum in 1819 shows a kangaroo in the right hand corner of the fireplace, but no other indigen no indigenous materials visible. The first donations of Australian material to Trin Trinity Museum are only listed in 1846. Unfortunately, no records were kept before Ball's arrival in 1844. Joseph Moore gave the University Museum, and I quote, a figure of an Australian armed and accoutred, prepared by the Attorney General of, General of Swan River. Unfortunately, no list of the donations survive, but it probably duplicated his gift 11 years earlier to the Royal Durban Society. Presumably the figure would have held spears, a spear thrower, even a boomerang, or potentially even the codge given by Whip, but there's no record of it on display in the college proceedings or any published accounts in the museum. The museum was reorganised by Robert Ball in 1850 and he removed the Cook collections which had been on display in the cases around this room here since the museum opened in 18, 1790. They moved downstairs to the new entrance hall in front of an armoury uh, with weapons displayed on the staircase walls. The new restrictions on space meant the material may have gone into storage or been distributed across the armory's walls. Oops, wrong way. There, there we go. Uh, to give you a sense of the space, or rather lack of it, the museum was situated above the gateway known as Regent's House. The picture here um, um, on the bottom left gives you a better sense of the scale of, of the room and the wall uh, and what would have been the walled cabinets and the very limited space on the image on the right which just shows you at the base of the staircase that the Cook Collection, Antiquities, the Harp of Brian Baru, and potentially Australian material was, was given after 1850. It's not a lot of space. So this is some of the material that was donated uh, from 1846 to 1853. Some of it is quite varied. Not much of it has actual provenances. Uh, Australia is just used really broadly. So again, it's quite difficult to match up individual donations to actual objects um, in the collections today. Moore's successor as colonial secretary was Rob, Richard Robert Madden, a historian of the Society of United Irishmen and a radical political group and a prob prominent abolitionist. Now, let's go on to Madden. Uh, Madden had studied medicine in Paris, though Moore read law at Trinity College, but they will probably have moved in the same cultural Dublin circles. It's probable that George and Joseph's more donation to the Dublin Society in 1835 and later Trinity College in 1846 inspired Madden's own West African gifts to the Royal Irish Academy in 1846 and his later Australian material to Trinity College. Um, Madden sent a small collection to Trinity um, sometime between 1849 um, and 1853. Um, this included material from the explorer Sir Augustus Charles Gregory, such as a box of minerals and an intricately knotted fishing net. Like more, Madden included Noongar names with his donation and an unbarbed spear and um, spear thrower from the Wadjuk Noongar in Perth, as well as a specimen of native silk obtained by Don 
Archbishop Don Salvado, founder of the Benedictine Mission of New Norcia. Only the fishing net today can be connected to Madden. It was probably acquired in Gregory's first expedition north of Perth in 1846, or during his investigations onto the Gascoigne River, as nets weren't really recorded in Swan River. The two skulls from the Victoria Plain presumably remain in Trinity College and were not listed in the transfer to the museum in 1882. To further complicate attributions, a Miss Webb, presumably a relative of George, also gave some spears and a hammer, and C.A.J.P.S., assumingly um, Charles, the Englishman Charles Alexander John Pies, um, Madden's own successor, um, also gave material described as a nose bones from Australia, petticoats from helpfully left blank, and a stone hatchet from King George's Sound. Um, these here could be some of the pieces from these donors. Now, P.S. had worked in Dublin Castle in the, oops, sorry, I've, I've gone the wrong way. There we go. P.S. had served as uh, secretary to the Central Loans Fund Board for 10 years before his short-lived promotion. Um, he died not long after he um, came into office, but some of his brothers also worked out in Australia and may be the source of material. Um, Tiffany mentioned the shield um, Moore saw at Henry Ball's house, described as about two and a half feet long. Unfortunately, neither of these two shields in Trinity College match those dimensions. I'm sorry, it was great and I was really excited and only to find out that no, that doesn't work. Um, these multiple donations to different institutions by a small group of Irish colonists and their relatives suggest Irish networks of patronage and support remain strong, both in Australia and amongst those remaining in Ireland. These objects made real the colonial world and those uh, who were far from hope, far away, it kept their memory alive in a public space. Now, these later donations to the Science and Art Museum after 1877 reflect very much the commercial development of the region and the discovery of gold in, in the Kimberleys in 1885, and the region's attraction to young men seeking new careers and opportunities not available in Ireland. Um, Edward, um, sorry, Edmund Power Dow Dowley was born into a prominent Tipperary Roman Catholic family, but left Ireland in 1885 and worked initially for the Crown as resident engineer in Kimberley and later became warden and res resident magistrate for the Kimberley Goldfields in 1889 to 92, when he returned briefly to Ireland. This was the time he donated 24 items, mainly Kimberley points, but also four hair waist belts and this nose ornament. As the Museum of Science and Art um, began to build an ethnographical collection, it also purchased entire collections from the government ethnologist Edward Hardman and the Prussian commercial collector, um, Emile uh, Clément whose detailed lists with indigenous names stress both the authentic their authenticity and an urgency to acquire material for the culture of a supposedly dying race. This deepened the commodification and monetization of this Australian material. Um, Edward Hardman, who'd worked on the Geological Survey of Ireland, became only the third government um, geologist in Western Australia in 1883, and his reports were used by prospectors in the Kimberley Gold Rush. He returned to Ireland in 1885 to continue to, um, to work and, uh, on the survey, but he struggled financially. While a permanent position in Western Australia was eventually offered him, it was too little too late, and he died in April 1887, not long after he'd sold the material to the museum, apparently in the wet and chilly Wicklow Mountains of typhoid fever. Hardman sold his collection of 108 objects for £30 to the museum. Material includes shields, weapons, personal adornment, objects used in initiation and Kimberley points in stone, rock crystal, and ones he had commissioned from glass bottles. The detailed provenances suggest Hardman may have been collecting with a view to selling the material to a museum. His paper to the Royal Irish Academy compared stone tools to ancient Irish weapons and prehistoric forms depicted in the work of his hero, the cultural evolutionist Sir John Lubbock. Many of the baskets and shields show few signs of use. While he collected shields carved into the traditional zigzag lines, he also acquired this one here with a distinctive petal shape. It was probably carved specifically for sale and reflected a creative output designed to appeal to a non-Indigenous audience and provided much needed cash money or food in uneven exchanges. The specific exchange value of museum specimens was also debated as part of an exchange with the Western Australian Museum and Art Gallery. Wicklow-born newspaper magnate, 
and politician and president of the museum, Sir John Winthrop Hackett, asked for copies of a Celtic cross, which he felt would be exceedingly interesting to all Irishmen, as, as well as antiquaries, and also reflected a quite strong Irish presence in the region. In exchange, the Australian Museum sent 28 well provenance objects, which director Bernard Woodward noted as genuine, and apparently were not fashioned by half original natives by means of European tools. Again, you're getting these sense of values coming out. These included items of personal adornment, domestic materials such as a bark container, stone knives, as well as five sacred boards and Chiringa from the Niagara, Gascoigne, Kimberley, Derby and, and Cookinee districts. The historic labels that accompany the objects allow them to be reconnected to their donor, to their collectors, such as the naturalist John Tunney, who collected for the Western Australian Museum, Archdeacon Edward Malancolic, who ministered in the Coolgardie goldfields, and as the Spanish missionary, Father Nicholas Emo, who worked in the fledgling Catholic missions of Broome, Drysdale, Drysdale River and Lombardina. From the beginning, the costs of producing and sending the casts to Australia were balanced against a list of 12 required mammals and birds, and Woodward promised to try and send good value in exchange. The packing and freight of the, cro of the cost, sorry, the packing and freight of the cross cost 41 pounds and the cross another 20 which was balanced against the 18 pounds valuation of the skins and skulls. The art and industry keeper, JJ Buckley, preferred not to acquire boomerangs as it apparently had plenty in store and selected 20 items from a list of 73 duplicates um, offered by, by the museum, the whole of which was valued at 30 pounds. This revaluing of individual objects into duplicates further reduced and devalued indigenous material already repurposed from expressions of country to museum artifacts. They became specimens and mediums for exchange to enable the expansion of collections into visual displays of typological development. Woodward subsequently complained to director Horace Plunkett in July 1915 that he hadn't had a fair exchange as the cost of the freight outweighed the duplicates, the value, outweighed the value of the duplicates, and he wanted a form of quid pro quo in the form of replicas or, or electrotypes of early Irish goldsmith work, um, such as torques and brooches. It's not yet certain if these were ever sent, but it appears Woodward's demands were halted by the outbreak of war. Staff were absent on war work and Plunkett's own departure from the museum in 1916. Did I put it there? Nungo material was reimagined and revalued from the moment it was collected. These varied from evidence to family in Ireland of the strange new world the colonists were now inhabiting, replica toys and games, to aerodynamic puzzles to be publicly solved or used as evidence of a Stone Age culture to illuminate Ireland's own prehistory. Once they arrived in the museum, they became carriers of social capital, reclassified as examples of racially inferior evolutionary and typological developments. As you can see in the Australia case here, you have a series of boomerangs showing how they, 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 their shapes and change, or as evidence of the wider economic opportunities available in the new colonies. Um, despite the Moore's careful descriptions and his vocabulary, few Noongar um, terms remain connected to the material and the primacy of the term boomerang over Kylie persisted in the public's imagination. Finally, the Noongar material could become mediums of exchange for copies of Celtic culture or other museum specimens valued more, perhaps, uh, than the Noongar material that um, they were already holding. Hopefully, they can now be reimagined once again as part of country and reclaimed as part of Noongar histories. I'll stop there. Thanks for that. Yeah, we'll just stop the screen. Yeah. There you go. So, opening up for discussion and questions. It's so nice, Rachel, that you have um, some of the exchange in Dublin that we can see in Perth in Woodward's letters about the cross and, yeah. Those I've never, I don't know. I've never seen a picture of the cross. I know it came in four big boxes. Um, big crates and they complained bitterly about the cost. It went on display on Easter Sunday in 1911 and then it just seems to have disappeared. It, it was destroyed in a storm, if I remember rightly, in 1927. So
So we have a newspaper article. I'll send it to you. So yeah. I mentioned Brilliant. it in uh, my paper last week, but um, oh, I, I missed yeah, that. I was on was, <laughs> Yeah, I know you were in Dublin. It's fine. It's it's really interesting to see how they oh, connect. should exchange papers because they do connecting points. Yeah, no, Moya has been looking, but she hadn't heard, uh, couldn't sort of track it down at that point when I spoke to her the other week. So yeah, there's a newspaper article that that um, documents its destruction via a storm. So it was so big that they couldn't actually fit it in the galleries. So it was out in the museum's courtyard with its oh, own yeah. special shelter. And there was a hailstorm and, sh and the shelter was basically destroyed and fell on the cross. And so that was the end of the cross. Mm. Oh, well, it was only plaster. And I think there'd been discussions about sending a shrine as well. Um, and then, the museum said actually we haven't got enough room please don't send it and it's that's the point that um woodward said to um, i'll try and send you really good value stuff if you have sent it anyway we'll try and find a space for it but luckily they hadn't at that point so it didn't actually go but al in that 1904 guide yeah there is a there is another gaelic object is there not a um oh there is. there is Rachel we better check this because um yeah, yeah the guide there is there is the cross and there is a kind of um is it a, like a, a sculptured replica of a um internment what do you call it? coffin you know but a stone one a sarcophagus. I'll have to have a look but um... a sarcophagus sarcophagus yeah that's right but it's a gay one Oh, that's interesting because you know they don't they don't seem to have sent the shrine but who knows what else they sent or whether that's something that went afterwards i don't know the the letters in the director's files just stop with woodward complaining that he hadn't that he wanted a better prid quo quo yeah and that's something that i was trying to figure out because i do get the impression that you know we sent many more specimens and objects on balance than came in so yes there's a question about valuing and who did the valuing and how things were valued. yeah i mean they were really clearly stating these natural history specimens are worth this much but apparently they'd sent a man out to, to camp for a is it the uh rat nose the rat kangaroo he was camping out for three weeks trying to find a specimen but they were nearly all extinct possibly because you have these museum collectors hunting them out exactly so, yeah, it was kind of semi-industrial collecting, really. I yeah, involved. definitely. Um, so, yeah, and he gave up after three weeks when he hadn't seen seen one. I'm not surprised. The poor thing's hiding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we need to go into cloud store and our, our kind of shared thing and and look at the at the museum guide. But I'm pretty sure there is another replica of something or other. Oh, that'd be really good. Yeah, and I might be able to. Uh, uh, get um, the archaeologist in Ireland to help identify it. They might know more. Oh, that'd be fantastic, Rachel. That'd be really good. Yeah, see if it's there. See if it matches. Um, I think I have got the name of the shrine, but um, because it didn't travel, like I didn't, I didn't write it down. Although, who who knows at this point? Yeah, yeah. Let, let us do the the work this end, and we'll we'll get back to you. Excellent. Do I you have a comment. Mark? Yes, Gay. Oh, hi, thank you very much, Rachel. That was really uh, great. And uh, all the interesting things about what was happening in Dublin in the early days was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought it was interesting when you mentioned the, the bark of the Swan River tea tree that George Fletcher Moore collected, and it was used for covering their huts. And I'm just, that prompted me to think um, that I've only ever seen one other example of that in a museum collection, which is in Aberdeen. And I'm just wondering if George Fletcher Moore might have sent objects elsewhere as well, because in Aberdeen, their sample is uh, bark, something like from the Swan River, uh, used for covering wigwams. Ah. Oh. So the, the wording to... is really quite similar. Yeah, we might have to track down Ali and see, and see if, she, if she knows. Um, although who's up in Edinburgh? Is it Neil? No, Aberdeen. I, Aberdeen. Yeah, I don't know who's in Neil Aberdeen. Neil Curtis. Yeah. Yeah, Neil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so nothing in Edinburgh, just Aberdeen then. Uh, yeah, that's the only other one I've, example I've seen. 
Interesting. Yeah, I don't know where that um, sample ended up. Um, presumably it got hived off into the natural history collections in the what was essentially a natural history museum from the Dublin Society. Um, they did have a small museum of so-called economic botany. But again, I've not found any exact specific references to material in that museum. And then later, those collections after 1877 were all absorbed as part of the Science and Art Museum Act into this national institution. So the botanic uh, material was sent to Glasnevin, the botanic gardens, um, indigenous material, anything relating to art and industry went to the, um, the new museum and natural history stayed in the Natural History Museum, which was a development on from the society's own natural history museum. So everything was really separated out. And again, very classified and um, into sort of different types of specific material, so. Mm. Julie. Nice to see you. Hello. 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 Um, I hope I've had missed the very, very end of your talk. Uh, the last thing I saw was that 1970s photo with a kind of typological display. So I hope my question was, wasn't covered in the last two minutes. Um, I just was wondering about what you thought about the value of those kind of collections in the context of Dublin today, in that institution in particular. I mean, a lot of the work that you presented there is like such detailed provenance research that other institutions are scrambling around to, to try and unpick and, and you've got it all kind of there. And I just wondered how that, you know, research matches up with the institution's vision for those collections now or in the near future. I, I actually had a really good conversation with the, uh, head of collections the other day. Uh, they're in the process of applying for a multi-million pound grant uh, in association with the National Museum of Northern Ireland, um, Trinity College Dublin uh, and the museum in, uh, in Dublin as well. And that will hopefully fund ongoing research into these types of collections, but also um, look at uh, uh, material that came out of conflict, both colonial conflict, but also material in Northern Ireland and um, pre and post partition. So that's a really interesting way they're looking at this in terms of conflict generally. Mm. Um, they're hoping that they might be funding for an ethnographer, a photographer and a conservator. They're really hoping to, to develop these collections. And that's part of the work I've been doing with them um, since I think 2016, I started writing this book proposal for them. Uh, let's just say I'm not the fastest of writers, um, but it will be out next year. I have to get it to them. Um, but things obviously have been delayed slightly with lockdown. But we're in the, uh, they've been really fabulous in allowing me un unprecedented access to collections and archives. Um, like most museums, their archives are not particularly well catalogued. Uh, and I've been using a lot of historic numbers, which are what the old archives have been historically stamped with, which aren't actually recorded on their new collections management documentation system, which does make tracking them down a bit tricky now. Things have been re-archived, but it's very much um, a case of things are moving swiftly on. They do want to display the material and they are, there is a lot more sort of sense and recognition of the really difficult and uncomfortable histories and the way this material was collected, but they recognise the value to communities today, but also in sort of reintegrating th this um, these collections histories into into sort of um, contemporary Irish sort of um, psyches and really pushed the fact that Ireland was really complicit in the British Empire and they were a key key sort of proponents in actually this uh, this rule ac across the empire and and beyond. So it's something I don't think that would have happened about ten years ago. Now mm. it's very much a, a, a really a climate change within the museums and particularly in Ireland also on the sort of the, the, the public stage it's again all this Black Lives Matter protests the much more awareness of what's happening and the museum are actually part of the Benin Dialogue group as well so they are looking to no not the Benin Dialogue the digital Benin group sorry so they are thinking about the restitution of looted Benin material as well so it's it's a slow process um, they're about 10, 15 years behind other European museums who, let's be honest, are not exactly at the forefront of, of this um, sort of shift either. But it's, uh, it's getting there. It's really exciting times. and I'm looking forward to what's going to happen in the next year or so. And hopefully with this new funding bid, more things may, may materialise and actually the collections may be more available 
um, publicly because they're not actually on a public database either, which makes things difficult. Sorry, that was Just a very further to that, they're, they're proposing the big conference next year, aren't they, in um, Belfast? That's the one in Belfast, yes. I think I'm meant to be speaking at that one and I can't remember what I've offered to write about. Yeah, so, so yeah, our group is, is, has yes. um, had a paper accepted as well, so we need to liaise Brilliant. about that. Oh, yeah, great, okay. fantastic. Yeah. So is that the Collecting the West group as well, or? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. They yeah, will I, I be think... representing us, but we'll, we'll go, right? Well, in that case, um, I'll, we, we ought to trapped like, again, as always. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, the, the emails with, with Gay are so productive. The amount of information she just bounces over. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? I'm like, ooh, no, ooh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gay. It's fabulous. Yeah, Gay's nice. I had a I had a kind of a general question. I really like that observation. Thinking again about those um, shields, the one that, that have the kind of the, the naming of the Swan River on it and those mm -hmm. objects. And just thinking about display, and I think you kind of touched upon this, you know, because obviously the Swan River Colony was known to people in Dublin. And it's just interesting to think about, um, you know, I guess the, the role of display in terms of making, like a, how the colony was perceived of through histories of display. And I'm, you know, because we're not really in the international exhibitions thing. So it's something quite different to what's happening with the exhibitions. And I'm also just reminded of Dale's, Tiff might have some idea, but Dale's panorama, right? So it's been exhibited around about this time in London with, you know, Jagan's head next to it, kind of making this argument for, you know, what one could expect of a place like the Swan River Colony. And I just want, it'd be, I mean, it might be hard to extract it from the Dublin information, but I'm just, um, mm -hmm thinking again about what display is doing um, over and above entertaining. I don't know, maybe others have an idea, Tiff might have an idea or Gay as well. Just by visibly putting the Swan River colony on the name of the yeah. label, it's just such an interesting thing. Yeah, it's yeah, that's the the were, yeah. And that's the only material from Webb that is labelled Swan River really prominently. Nothing yeah. else is. None of George's was, but his was published um, in the printed proceedings, which would have been widely distributed and would have been known in the in the Dublin intellectual circles. Um, so, and again, his web seeds were, were again noted as from Swan River, Swan Swan River, and again printed in the public proceedings. But George um, George Moore's description of his six items—that's the longest description I've ever seen for about seventy years in the descriptions uh, of the published proceedings. Normally, it's a single line. So, so like, yeah. So part of the web story is that his gun—he he brought the earliest cap-fired rifle into the colony. And it was put. It was gifted to the museum, and that and the history of it was actually part of its history of display as well. So it was captured by Noongar people that then they had to go and retrieve it from the, I mean, Tiff, you might know the story. It was found in their camp mm -hmm. and the stock had been burnt off and, the, and they had to grab the, the gun back. And eventually it was exhibited in the WA Museum. So there's this kind of complex web of web objects, if you like, um, in terms of, I guess, the early colony. There's a newspaper George article. Joseph Webb. That must be Joseph Webb, yeah. But I'll send you, the, there's an article. There in, are a few webs around, aren't there? Um, yeah, the other one gets called jo George Joseph, but all the family stuff is JG Webb, so mm -hmm. Joseph George. So I'm not entirely sure. I'm hope I'm really hoping they remain the same person <laughs> if there's not many webs around. I've got a, a kind of question that sort of relates to that because of Webb's um, role in the commissariat, and I'm, I'm interested in that network, the commissariat, kind of node as a kind of place of a site of collecting and the, and the network of, of um, the, the officers, the commissariat officers. But I was also interested in the kind of networks that you were, you, you know, you mentioned the Irish networks of patronage and how strong they were. And um, this isn't really a question, I guess, but I'm sort of just interested in um, that network of, and the, and the connections between these collectors um, in Swan River and in Ireland and the Royal Dublin Society, the Trinity Museum, um, well, Trinity College Museum, and which is at the university, and then and then uh, the museum as well, the, the violence. So I'm just kind of interested in those those networks of um, of I guess thinkers and collectors and 
is obviously a, a very rich time and the same happening in other places as well, both in, in um, these metropolitan sites, but also in the colonies, um, these sort of little societies that are in, in Swan River and, and Van Diemen's Land and, and everywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't really have a question for it, but it's just sort of, I'm just kind of intrigued by that network and how, how strong that is in terms of these collecting moments and, um, yeah, the kinds of knowledge that's being generated. I was really struck by that Joseph Scott Moore's kind of um, take up of, of, of uh, his brother's um, collection and, and, and description of, you know, how these artefacts are used. Um, yeah, so it's sort of, I guess it's that, I mean, it's that, that typical kind of armchair versus armchair uh, collectors versus the, the people on the ground. But um, yeah, have there been, has there been much work on these networks of the societies? And there must have been, I guess I just haven't done any thinking about. It, it really varies from what angle you're looking at it. Um, mm. the, a book has just come out yesterday, it was launched at, mm. the, Royal, at the Natural History Museum in Dublin. Uh, by a, a wonderful woman called Shara, Shara Murphy on the history of the Natural History Museum. And she's looking at this, the science collecting that's going on. And we're actually in conversation about how these collectors uh, often overlap because until about the 1870s, material was coming into the Royal Dublin Societies as natural history collections mm. with a few random add-ons of indigenous material, which sometimes they're mentioned and sometimes they don't. So you're having these same collectors uh, donating a variety of material, but they're also donating to the same institutions. Madden donated to Trinity College, Irish Academy, um, Dub uh, uh, Dublin Society, and all these collections are now merging together after mm. 1877 and, and 1890s, when these, uh, these collections are now moving into state control. So again, you've got that very much revaluate and reclassify material as much more specimens again coming in whereas in the Dublin society they're much more sort of curiosities they're not really sort of described um labeled apart from the ones put on by the donors mm -hmm. um it's really difficult to get a sense of exactly how material was exhibited in, in the Dublin society there's not many references to it the only catalogue is from 1813 um, which again lists all the indigenous material as miscellaneous. Um, so there's not many descriptions of what material is happening. And I have got a very small plan uh, showing some of the museum um, in material in the Natural History Museum, but it consists of, this is a case of Fijian material, this is Japanese, this is Indian, uh, more Japanese, and I think there's a bit of Africa, but that's it. And I don't know what date that small plan um, um, comes from. So. It's, it's very piecemeal, but I think looking at how this, these collectors, mainly from this growing, really emerging professional middle classes, both Catholic and Protestant, are actively mm -hmm. collecting material. Um, they're part of administrative structures. They're um, involved in medical and, and military professions, and they were bringing this sort of mat material into Ireland, and it's really growing. And I think part of my research and, Sher and Shera's uh, research is pulling this together. So... Hers is now done, so I'm going to be looking at that um, when my, it's Cork University Press, okay. her book is, and I can't, let me see if I can just... Uh, What's her surname, sorry? Uh, Murphy. Murphy, sorry, yeah, okay. Just let me have a, have a quick look on at my wonderful Facebook feed and see if I can find her, her book title. It was, um, George, it was... Was George Fletcher Moore's rifle? I just sent you a screenshot. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll try and find out more about that one. That'd be brilliant. And um, I remember that was that rifle was displayed in the replica of George Fletcher Moore's house in the exhibition that used to be in Hackett Hall. Hmm. See. Yeah. Interesting. And there were readings of his letters recorded there. But I'm kind of thinking, you know, historically, this fits in with um, that kind of massive movement that Nick Thomas, in one of his books, um, kind of points to around provincial, you know, the whole growth of provincial museums and mechanics institutes, but all of them being infiltrated or shaped really by 
um, imperial connections. So your naval officers, your commissariats, your lawyers, your you know, so this kind of provincial culture that was this middle professional middle class that was very much shaped by empire. And so it sounds to me like Dublin is just, you know, another example of that, as indeed is the Mechanics Institute in Perth in the Swan River Colony. Yeah. It's just a later version of, but it's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm. And they're not necessarily yeah. uh, intellectuals, you know, they're not necessarily very learned. It's, it's more about the social capital that this gives them, which I think you were pointing to, Rachel, in... Yeah, I mean that in a way, the function of the labels is as much about the collector as it is about the place that the objects come from. I think. Yeah, and almost sometimes the label is more important than the objects. You sometimes oh, yeah. get a label that almost covers the object. And you 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 can't actually see what things are. Yeah. Let's see if I can get to bring this up. That yeah. net, that net from King George Sound. That was sorry. That miss. That was mislabeled, was it? That's. The one from the gas coin, the one from the gas, yeah. it's got King George Sound written on it. Yeah, I assume that came from an old display label that yeah. has since been lost because that little brand label was written when it was transferred to the museum so after 1882 because okay. it acknowledges the Trinity Museum collections. But um, where that attribution came from, I presume it was part of Madden's original attribution. Mm -hmm. But I know one, um, but presumably North from the Gascoigne, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know. Do you have any more ideas on the origins of that gate? Um. No, but certainly somewhere um, mid north coast of Western Australia. So uh, I think uh, Tiffany's probably more up to date with uh, the Gregory and exploration than I am. Not really, not at the moment. But yeah, I don't I mean, certainly not King George Sound, obviously. But um, yeah, it'd be, yeah, I didn't know that connection with Gregory. So it'd be interesting to follow up on a bit more. It's, such a, it's a beautiful net. It looks oh, a lot amazing. like that. Yeah, that close. But it looks like the Midwest and North are there as well. So it's, um, it's, a it's a very rare object. It reminds me, Rachel, that, you know, at the start of this project, when we became aware of that Irish material, you know, the promise really is kind of to use that material to kind of present, you know, a lot of that material culture back to, you know, Perth, because it's really missing from the museum collection mm -hmm. as it currently stands. And so, I mean, it's interesting that there's larger projects imagined by them and it would be really I think significant to have Wham involved um, as part of that as well so yeah I think actual having a person dedicated to investigating and looking after these collections is going to be key uh, the museum has never had a dedicated individual ethnographer or otherwise to look after these collections they've always been subsumed under something um, until 1930 something they were subsumed under art and industry after that, they became sort of comparative collections um, and then shifted under the care of Irish antiquities as the museum was trying to reimagine re their own sort of Irish and Celtic histories. The foreign material was sort of deemed sort of not as important and they tried to get rid of classical statues and bits and pieces which were scattered around the museum as for art and industry purposes. Um, so they've recentered into a, an Irish focus um, um, after they became a sort of independent, but mm. there was no money, no, no staff. The galleries were shut for about four years during the Civil War. Um, want furniture from different galleries, museums, offices in Leinster House, which became the Irish Parliament. The Dale was shoved into the museum. Um, and then the ethnographic galleries, basically, they'd been redisplayed in the early 1910s by Geoffrey Stanton. Um, despite independence and this desire to have this comparative sort of foreign, foreign overseas material to compare to Irish ethnographic material, nothing happened. Um, Irish ethnography did develop more, but the sure. overseas ethnographic collections, the gallery just stayed static. Um, collection numbers plummeted. They didn't really acquire new material. There was no money, no time, no staff. It's the standard, um, but the Irish institution was particularly struggling as it just emerging um, independently in its own right. So it's really that's interesting that's, to see how things. That's really interesting. So from that date, so the director that was 
uh, connecting Wood Woodward back in Perth, the Irish one wanted the ethnographic material for comparative yes. purposes to establish ancient Irish material. And yep. there's Woodward wanting Gaelic material for his museum. It's a really interesting. So they're both yep. wanting each other's, but for different, complete different purposes. purposes. Yeah. And then to work in, with that. Yeah. yeah. And then in 1970, um, material started being re repatriated. Uh, I say repatriate, it's a slightly loose restitution because a Tahitian mourner's costume ended up going to Hawaii. You had the coat of uh, a Métis uh, Canadian rebel, Louis Réal, uh, went to the National Museum of Canada, the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Um, so they're trying to, uh, the, the director, A.T. Lucas at this time was really keen on you know, the UNESCO sort of 1917 convention of illicit uh, trade and things and was trying to restitute material. He had no money, no staff, um, people were not interested in it um, and they started conversations with museums across the world to try and return this, uh, return it. Now that was actually led independently by an American anthropologist Edward, uh, Edmund Carpenter, um, independent of the museum. Individual pieces were able to be repatriated but then the museum wasn't able because it was a state institution to alienate as it as it as the government saw material um, um, to other places. So you had this just a start in, in the 70s of trying to repatriate material. Um, and also in the hope, as I think Lucas was saying, to get this Irish material in overseas museums, particularly the um, British Museum, back to Ireland. So you have this real national push, um, but again, it's completely full by no money and, and, and staff. So it's a really interesting time. Oh, mm. I will quickly share my screen just so you can see, hopefully. Where is it now? Can I make this bigger? Uh, oh, it didn't work, hang on. Can yeah, you see? Uh, make that bigger. Yeah, First National Museum. Yep, hang on, let me, yeah. let me shrink that. There we go, yeah. This is that's her book. Let's share it. Where is it sharing gone? Oh, no. And I just, I just closed all the wrong bits. <laughs> Why can't I share my screen again? Oh, there it is down there. Hang on. Try and make it all fit on one screen with, with too many windows open doesn't necessarily work. I go back that way. I just, I just shared it in the um, chat as well. You oh, can, good. I'm, I'm glad that worked. Yeah. Um, Hang on, get back there. There you go. Oh, yeah, yes. there. There you go. That's, so, yeah, that's, amazing, that's an amazing, that's an amazing, amazing music, picture. Isn't it? Yeah, it's still yeah. like it. And they've got the wonderful um, things there from Ber from Bernia and Doray Island that were presumably collected when it was a um, when there were the Aboriginal um, medical quarantine in place. Yeah, so, the whole building's currently empty. Uh, they oh. shifted yeah everything out they're having roof works so oh. if um, there's an amazing blog by the curator um, the dead zoo diary on facebook uh, and you can see some of these naturalistic specimens being created out the windows um, it's fabulous so major roof works going on i think they anticipate returning it back to sort of the um, as it was um, oh. because it's it's really affectionately known as the Dead Zoo, and it's a Dublin sort of um, landmark. Well, so, the Dead Zoo. Um, yeah. we've come to the end of our our time, so I'm going to um, unless anyone has something else they want to say. I mean, um, you know, this is our last talk in the series, and Andrew and I are reflecting on it. And it, you know, we did these so that some of the people who are contributing to the edited volume next year um, on the on the project. Um, can get start to get their ideas together. And Rachel, I can't wait to see your chapter. So uh, I'm sure you'll be a faster writer for this. Um, so I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you my photographs if you send me the chapter. How about that? So I use the photographs. Okay. Has it been two years since you took me? I, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, um, I have to say the seminar has been really useful in getting me to actually get back to this. Yeah. So yeah, I think bouncing a draft over, because that's the thing, I'm not, a Noongar specialist in any shape or form and I'm really aware of that particularly with the use of terminology 
so having this edited volume i think an opportunity to talk about these bits and pieces so be really helpful okay. Ooh, there's a message from annalise, yeah, from annalise. yeah she's yeah. suggesting jane Barm. i'll send you jane's link she's um an oh, professor here as well so yeah she should be good on that thanks annie yeah brilliant well, thank you for that one all right everybody. Uh, and we'll send you the stuff on the cross we'll send you what we yeah have. that'd be really good have you got all the letters from Dublin side on the Western Museum Exchange. We've got not all of them, got some. We've got some. We've got whatever I can get out of the archives. Was that the director's file? Did you get the whole folder? No, um, I got it from the letters book. The one I have is from the letters book. So maybe Al, you got something from some other. Yeah, but maybe we should share with you, Rachel, what we've got. And yeah. 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 Yeah, are we transfer the, for the folder? Um, the, the images are not individually named, but they're all in a folder and you can do what you like with them. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll share what we've got on that particular transaction as well and, and the afterlife of <laughs> over the cross. Yeah, exactly. Oh, poor thing though, flattened in a storm. Yeah, what flattened happened in a storm, you? just dissolved. But when you put plaster outside, well, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose they thought the roof would stand up, but it just didn't. I think the uh, Perth weather's a bit stronger than islands. <laughs> Not the soft rains. No. So, yeah. But no, it's really interesting to see all these connections over the seminars. It's been really useful. I'm looking forward to them all going up live. Uh, and I think sharing these uh, connections and the different sort of bits and pieces. I hadn't heard about um, Webb's gun. So that's fabulous. Thank you for that one. It's oh, in fact, George, George Moore, Moore's house had a replica made. Yeah, there was a replica of his house in Hackett Hall. So the exhibition... Is that, is that Winthrop, Winthrop Hackett? Yeah, so Hackett Hall is part of the WA Museum now, but it was next door and it used to be the library. And uh -huh. um, James Batty, the first librarian of the Batty Library, kind of reigned over that particular library in Hackett Hall. Okay. But when the museum, so in, when was that exhibition? Uh, sort of very late 90s, early 2000s, there was a, an exhibition um, that Matt Trinker, who's now director of the National Museum of Australia, but when he was a senior curator at WAM, he was involved with Margaret Anderson doing um, an exhibition inside Hackett Hall, which was really around, I can't remember the name, but it was kind of landscapes of, of WA. And so there was a, a, a part of it that was about the colonial Swan River colony, well, about the Swan River colony. Um, and in there, they had a replica Fletcher Moore hut slash house, so the very first, sort of abode that he would have created. And they had um, recordings of his letters, of his diaries, sorry, oh. diaries, um, on sort of playing. So he had a soundscape. Yeah. And I am pretty sure that his gun was sort of hanging on the wall of the hut. Wow, that's interesting, yeah. So oh, yeah, if, if we should be able to get, I'm sure that there would be photographs of that exhibition because that's late 90s um mm, interesting early 2000s because yeah. yeah it's really interesting with Hackett and Moore and uh, Hackett and Plunkett and Bantering White who was the chief clerk in Dublin at the time they're all talking about their boyhood and all the people that they have in common so you still have these networks um, yeah um, and I think the letter yeah. I've seen is from White yeah um Henry Bantry White he was the chief yeah. clerk and basically chief bigwig and basically authorised all sorts of financial payments and stuff. So, yeah. All right. So we'll be in touch with more records for you and vice versa. Fabulous. <laughs> so really good. Thanks, Rachel. We'll work.